welcome to our very first Australian Story Live. We are so thrilled that you could all come out tonight. Saying the word story reminds me of the powerful and rich storytelling tradition of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. And so, of course, I pay my respects to their elders, past, present, and future, because it's their land on which we are all gathered tonight. What did you think of Gina's episode? <laughs> Well, we are so lucky because that force of nature herself is with us tonight. Would you please welcome Gina Chick? <laughs> Thanks for having me. Wow. <laughs> What's it like to watch other people talking about their impressions of you? Yeah, but they're all people I love. So, you know, it's not like they've gone out and, like, trolled through through the, 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 the dastardly 90s and found, you know, someone from a back corner of a nightclub and trucked them out. <laughs> oh, I mean, yeah. these, these are all people who are pretty much, you know, in the marketing department. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's all right. Um, I tell you what did actually hit the cutting room floor, but it was it was a really lovely anecdote. It was your sister talking about how you never want to see a sausage roll again because you had to eat so many sausage rolls in the lead up to alone. Oh, yes, yeah. I actually, it's the licorice bullets. <laughs> I ate 460 grams of licorice bullets in a day. The first shot started about three <laughs> hours later. The last shot was about three days later. <laughs> no more licorice bullets. <laughs> so the program tonight opened with shots of you getting ready for the Logie Awards, which was a few weeks ago. What's this journey been like where you've gone from Gina in the bush to Gina on the red carpet and kind of this environment that's about as manufactured and far away from nature as you could get? Yeah, it's wild, but you know, it's, I think there's a bit of a Cinderella in me as well. You know, there's, I love dressing up, as you saw with the possum coat. Uh, you know, part of it was practical and part of it is because I think I do have a bit of an inner diva, even if it's a bush diva. Like, there's, there's something about me, it's probably from the 90s, actually, from being a bit of a diva on Oxford Street. So I found that the whole alone journey is actually letting me express all of these different parts of myself. And there's a context where it's like, okay, red carpet, do the whole thing, but do it barefoot. You know, and I have, I've managed to get away with not wearing shoes for anything so far, and now it's a brand. <laughs> but more seriously, I feel like a wild person. I feel like a wild creature in a human body. And for me, it's really important to spend time in the wilderness, uh, spend time connecting with nature. But it's also, I'm in a body in this time, in this life, in a modern world. And so I'm interested in survival skills in all the jungles. So it's about being able to stitch the worlds together. To take your jungle analogy, so say if you had to survive in a concrete jungle like Tokyo for a year or two years, do you feel like you'd be able to do that? I'd be able to do that, but I wouldn't be a very happy wolf in, in that one. And I would find ways to then go out and find wilderness as little oases. Anywhere the, where there's grass and a bird, I can find it. If there's a tree, I can find it. The more grass, the more birds, the more trees, the more I can expand. But if I had to do it in Tokyo, in a one block park, you'd probably find me on my, on my tummy, like watching the ants and you know, having conversations with them. So how have Australians responded to you when they see you in real life after having watched alone? It's the most gratifying thing. I was expecting to get trolled. Like that bully kid in me is like, really, really, are we gonna do this? And then I've found the most staggering thing, which has been that there has been zero trolling, like none, like I, who, who gets that? And so as a result, when I walk down the street, people come up and they are like so happy and so grateful and they want to connect and, like I want to connect, like I'm making a stand for connection. So if someone comes up and they're like, oh my goodness, my, my kids love watching you or my, you know, my 90 year old mother thinks you're great or we've just built a fire in the backyard or we're going camping or many of the people who come to stop me are women and especially postmenopausal women. Yeah. <laughs> 
And the story is, thank you for showing that we don't have to be invisible. Thank you for showing that we have wisdom in these bodies. Thank you for showing that we earn these bloody silver feathers. And so, yeah, like the, so I have been so humbled and gratified by the response that I've received from wherever I go in Australia. I'm just like, oh, I'm just really touched. It felt like you always had a strong sense of yourself, even from childhood, but did you, or is it something you've learned? I can remember being in, I think, fourth grade, and uh, the PE teacher got us to walk around in a circle. You know, it's, it's, you know, it's a hot day, Aussie school, and you know, walk around in a circle. And I took a step outside the circle and I walked the other way at school. <laughs> On purpose. Now, I didn't have any friends. Do you know why? <laughs> um, yeah, I always had a really, really strong sense of myself and also had a really strong, um, like, this drive not to change. Like, I just couldn't do the thing where I would contort to be liked, which is then why I didn't have any friends. But that then, uh, then has ended up making sense you know, in my 20s and 30s and 40s and 50s. But, you know, at school, it was a pretty rough ride. You said in the program that as a child, you didn't understand humans. Do you feel like you do now? Yeah, yeah. I, it took me a long time to learn how to be a human. But I, I figure I've kind of, I figured it out. Back then, there were no diagnoses. You know, we didn't get hauled along to find out what letters would be after our name. And, I, you know, if I had, it'd be an alphabet. And I've had to learn how to be a human in a body where the world didn't make sense. But I've, I've, like, I've spent so long kind of going, well, what is that? What's actually going on? And I guess healing the parts of me that didn't know how to be vulnerable with people or didn't know how to be, you know, have a conversation. And, um, and these days, I, I love the fact that I'm a human, which I, 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 you know, I definitely wouldn't have said when I was a kid. One of the moments in Alone that I think most resonated with viewers was when you got to that point where you said, actually, I really, I've tried to tell myself I don't need people, but I actually really do, and my God, I'd really like a hug right about now. What does it actually feel like to be without any human contact for so long? Like, what, it, what does it feel like? Yeah, for me, like, I'm an introvert, I, and I use extroversion as a survival mechanism, I'm a bit like a puffer fish. You know, a puffer fish, when it gets threatened, it goes... <laughs> basically, you cannot get near me. <laughs> and so I learned very young to, to use my energetic size and my personality to keep people away. Um, but I, you know, for, for me, the definition of an introversion is someone who is fueled by solitude, and the definition of an extrovert is someone who is fueled and nourished by connection with, with people. So for me, being alone for 67 days, like I was, I was not lonely. And there were a couple of times when I had, you know, moments of missing people, but the world that I live in is so connected to every single living thing. Like that platypus, Lady Lorela, she was my friend. Like I would chat with her every day and she would chat back in platypus. And when I'd go to harvest, a, a, you know, a, a, like a little sapling, I'd say, hey, you know, do you want to be part of my shelter and, and you know, do something that none of your mates are doing? And <laughs> <laughs> so the solitude part for my personality was amazing. Your friend said he thought you could have stayed out there forever. Yeah, Stevie, bless. Um, I mean, I could have stayed out there forever. There was a point where um, I lost contact with, with base camp from a, for a satellite issue. And for a moment, I was like, has there been a war? Like, am I out here forever? Are they, can they come and get, does anyone know that I'm here? And it was real, like for quite a few hours, I didn't know if I was going to be out there. And then it, it got real, really fast. I was like, oh my goodness, I could be out here on my own, the crazy lady with the wild hair, like talking to the platypus and blah, chewing on raw eels. And uh, that was not a good thought. I could do it, but the idea of not having a village at that point would be, oh, that would be heartbreaking. So, so one of the things that keeps you going is on some level the knowledge that it's not forever, that it will end yeah, at some point. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, 
because we're designed to live in villages. That's how we're designed. The human animal is designed to live in packs. We're designed to live in groups. And in, the, in our DNA, the 350,000 years that we've been Homo sapiens, we, you know, for 340,000 of those years-ish, we were hunter-gatherers living in small bands, moving through the landscape to get our needs met from the land. Like, that is the predominant information in our DNA. And so I think we all resonate with that. Speaking of small bands, I want to ask you about Lee, because I think people also really were so touched by that moment at the end of Alone when you turned around and, and Lee was there. To have that relationship that you have now, how hard was it to consciously go, we can decide how this operates. We don't have to be defined by other people's expectations of how exes are meant to be. There was a transition period that was very uncomfortable. But w what I found is that when I love, I love. I, I can't just turn it off. Like if I love someone, I only want them to flower and blossom. And to me, it's like, I can't say what someone's journey is or what their soul's purpose is, that's, that's actually nothing to do with me. So when we made our, our, our separation, we pretty quickly found a, a shape together where we could still facilitate together, where we could still be friends, where we could still totally piss each other off and have screaming arguments. Lee has the ability to press my buttons like <laughs> no one. He turns me into a banshee. And, um, and I'm grateful to that because, like, you know, that's, it's not a normal state. So I get to explore my rage. I get to explore the part of me that completely lose my shit. And it's been a bit of a journey, but it's a good one. You and Lee separated so he could make the choice to be a father. But because of your age and, and so forth, you didn't have the choice to be a mother. To an outsider, that looks like an almost superhuman level of selflessness to allow him to make that choice when you weren't going to have that choice yourself. I tend to try to live my life in relationship with capital R reality, not the reality I think should be or that I want or that I think is fair because life isn't like that and this is just what was actually there. So he had a whole bunch of desire to be a dad. I was done with being a mum that's like, there, there it is, like, you can't argue. Well, I couldn't argue with that. What's it been like post alone to have so many more people know who Blaze is and to be invested in her story? Beautiful. I think anyone who's lost, not just a child, but anyone close to them, one of the things that happens is people don't know what to say. And so they say, I'm sorry for your loss. How many times do you hear that? I'm sorry for your loss which just means I, I got no idea and I've got to say something. And like we live in a culture that for me doesn't have healthy rituals of grief. It doesn't have, you know, when you look at um, First Nations cultures, uh, there's like, there's beautiful ceremonies and rituals. There's ways of holding us in our grief. It just means that for anyone walking around after a loss, we're not supported by our culture. And what happens is that we don't get to hear their name. I mean, does anyone relate to that? Like you've, you've lost someone and then where do you get, when do you get to hear their name? And so for me, you know, I lost my daughter 10 years ago and all of a sudden she's alive again in all of these people who are coming up to tell their stories of loss or grief or telling me that they loved a photo or that they, you know, they resonated with me keening next to a fire and, you know, wailing and, and feeling a resonance for that. And that, for me, is now we're telling the truth. And that, that is what I live for, the telling the truth part. I'd rather we all just told the truth because now we're actually having a conversation. So I'm really grateful that she gets to be a part of it. Let me ask you about one more thing before I go to the audience to take some questions. When the Alone finale was about to air, up on social media, out of the blue, pops a video of Hugh Jackman going, oh, I just want to wish my very, very good friend Gina Chick all the best and I'm rooting for her to win the finale of Alone. It's like, what this extraordinary woman who's got the whole nation transfixed also is best friends with Hugh Jackman. <laughs> How on earth is this possible? <laughs> oh, my Hubie. Um, 
Oh, so Hugh, Hugh, Hugh and I met on day one uh, the, at, uh, around the corner here at UTS at the Uni of Technology doing communications. We sort of collided in the very unglamorous cafeteria with the fluorescent orange chairs and the RSL spew carpet and the $2 fried rice. And, um, and we started talking and then we didn't stop pretty much for the whole day. We missed the whole first day of classes. And... I don't know, there's people in your, uh, there's people I think in all of our lives who there's just an instant recognition and that was what it was, you know, 35 years we've been friends. So yeah, he's just, he's my buddy. <laughs> my name is Penny and I watched your show and I have to admit, I watched it with my children and the first episode I thought we all said, oh my God, you're nuts. And by the end of the 10 weeks, we all just fell in love with you and your story and everything about you and your genuineness. So I guess my question to you is, what is your advice for people who are a little bit different to make connections quicker when they're not necessarily the normal? Yeah, that's a really good question, Penny. The thing that I've found through alone was the first time, the first time you saw me dancing in the moss, it's like, oh my God, she's, she's loco, she's loopy. And then the second time, it's like, oh, Maybe there's a little bit more there. And then it actually didn't take long for people to drop in. So what I, I think people connect with is real. It's when we're real. And to be a bit different, it can feel very unsafe to be real because the feedback that we get from the world is, is that it isn't safe. And what I've found through alone is that by allowing that authenticity to shine through, it may not be for everyone, but for the people who are willing to engage with, with real, there, there is, the doors are now open. And what that looks like, I think, is different for, for everyone. Hi, Gina. I'm Prue. Uh, I was thinking about your writing. You write with an amazing capture of language and of such beautiful expression on your socials and in your blog. And what was it like for you when you found out that Charmian Clift was your grandmother? Was that an epiphany and did it connect you to something? Yeah, thanks, Prue. Yes, it did. I mean, the first thing when I found out that Charmian was this sort of wild trailblazing woman, I was like, I was like 20 when I found out about Charm at the, you know, height of my own wildness. And my first thing was, oh my God, thank goodness, I make sense because I hadn't really made sense anywhere, but now it's like there's this direct line of, of wildness. So that was, that was incredible. And finding out that she was a writer also, because I've been writing and I've been loving writing since I was a kid, and, and I could feel the river of words, you know, almost coming from her into me. But here's something really interesting. I don't read her work because I'm so sort of ferociously defensive of my own voice. I don't want to be um, influenced by her style. And, and so it's like, because I can feel there is so much of her in me. Uh, Jane, hello. Um, Gina, do you still feel you're too big for the world or do you think it's ready for you now? <laughs> I don't feel like I'm too big for the world anymore. And I'm so, so super grateful to have this whole experience happening when I'm in my 50s rather than in my 20s or my 30s, because I think I probably would have, with all of that bigness and wildness, probably blown up um, in destructive ways. N now I, I feel like I can dance with my own bigness and find a, a way to, to fit that into the world. And I, and I feel that increasingly there is room for women to be, you know, n not obedient, not good girls, to have a voice, you know. We're still bashing away on that ceiling, but I, um, I don't feel like there are ligatures and strictures around my size anymore, and, and it's really nice to be able to breathe. It's like taking your bra off and going, oh. <laughs> Let the girls free. <laughs> Gina, let me ask you one question to finish. On Australian Story, Lee said that on a loan, there's a philosophy that relates to the whole of life. Do you agree? And what is that philosophy? I think that we live in a culture that pathologises discomfort. 
Right? Anything that makes us feel slightly uncomfortable, it's like, oh, quick, you know, reach for a durry or reach for the TV or doom scroll or go get laid or go smoke a spliff or, you know, go for a run, whatever. Anything to not feel discomfort. Whereas like, we only grow when we're uncomfortable. And so being able to have tools to be in the, that discomfort and hold ourselves there, that's when we start to metabolize the edges of that fear of, of whatever it's going to be and realize it ain't going to kill us. And then our world gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And we can find what the discomfort is teaching us. And then we can rely on ourselves and that self-reliance becomes the ground that we stand on. So then every step that we take is in our own rightness. So if that's a philosophy, I have no idea what I just said, but that would probably be it. <laughs> Please thank Gina. Uh... <laughs> that was wonderful. Thank you so much.